Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, everybody out there in podcast land. This is uh, the Bunny Rabbit's Hole. And of course, I am Jason, and this is my trusty co-host. I am Craig. Yes. And oddly enough, we are recording this on a Sunday. And it's Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Listen to our fucking podcast. Yes, exactly. And then... Uh, uh, follow us on uh, social media at, uh, at Twitter and Instagram. We are the Bunny's Hole at the Bunny's Hole. If I can say that again, the uh, Bunny's Hole. So it's 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 the Bunny's Hole. Yes, exactly. Point blank, bam, Bunny's Hole. That's uncomfortable. <laughs> Quite. But <laughs> all right. So this is the Bunny Rabbit's Hole, and what we do here is we take a central theme each week. And we uh, delve into that, we research it, we give opinions on it, and then we talk about it, and then whenever something strikes us to go down another bunny rabbit's hole, we do exactly that. We're not afraid to go down any avenue or turn or twist until we finally exhaust that, or Craig finally gets tired of me blabbing, and he wants to talk, so he, we bring it back to the main theme, and of course, we have to give out a little bit of warning. All right, here is our warning, or disclaimer, if you will. We research every topic that we do, and we don't just research the, the parts that fit our narrative, but we also research parts that don't fit our narrative as well. So everything is based off of facts, but we also mix our opinions in as well because this is entertainment and it's our show, so we're going to tell you what our goddamn opinion is. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to steal this from another podcast that I heard. It is uh, the podcast Dark Topic. He said something in one of his podcasts a little bit ago where he says, I don't really care. I'm just looking. For, he goes, I want fans. I want like-minded people. And yes. uh, listen to Dark Topic, great podcast. But it, I want to borrow that line because we are also looking for like-minded individuals to uh, respond to respond in the comments and tweet to us and let's talk, let's open up a dialogue and all that stuff because we love chatting and we love talking and if we didn't love talking, we wouldn't fucking be doing this. Right. And this isn't your average podcast because, you know, yes, we do our research and we sometimes will go, hey, all right, this is how we're going to do this one and lay out a format. Yeah, we don't stick to any formats. No. We kind of go random. <laughs> No, no. This is like if you bought a set of house plans from an architect and then you just went, eh, fuck it. Right. <laughs> you what you wanted. And it turns out looking like something Picasso did. But you know what? It's yours. You own it. So there. And that's what we do. We own this. We love doing this. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be here. Right. But that's getting repetitive. So what are we talking about today, Craig? Today's topic is... The crime of the century, or right, the many, right. many, many crimes of the century. <laughs> exactly. And that's one thing that I loved about this topic, because there are so many crimes that have been called the crime of the century. Well, first of all, we don't know what century. We don't know, is it this century? Because we found some that are this century, and it's really early in this century, so how can it be the crime when we haven't had the rest of the, the century? And there are some, a bunch of them from last century. But right. they're from all the, the the whole gambit of the century. But what I loved about it is everything from it was there's from murders to kidnappings to heists to everything was the crime of the century. So at the end of this, I'm going to ask you which one you think is truly the crime of the century. And when we say century, we're just going to go back the last. I think the earliest one I have is 19. 1900. Okay. 1900 is the earliest one that I have. But so we'll say the last 120 years or so. Right. Um, Post Lincoln. Yeah. How about that? Even farther. Last right. 150 years. And I mean, we already know what the crime of this century is because it's still being investigated. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It may have something to do with the Russia with love. Right. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, I during my research, and you found the same topic is from a Time Magazine um, site, and I'm just going to read off all 25, and then we'll go back and touch on them and some other ones, just so you guys get an idea of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll start off with the first one was the Lindbergh kidnapping. 
Um, then there's the stealing of the Mona Lisa, which happened in 1911. The fake ape man from 1912. The fatty Arbuncle scandal from 1920. The Black Dahlia from 1947. The Brinks job from 1950. The Lana Turner affair from 1958. The Great Train Robbery of 1963. Richard Speck, that creepy fucker from 1966. Oh, yeah. The Tate LaBianca murders from 1969. The Patty Hearst kidnapping from 1974. The Son of Sam from 1977. John Wayne Gacy, 78. Ted Bundy, 78. Popular year for serial killers. America's Biggest Art Heist from 1990. There's quite the gap there. Jeffrey Dahmer from 91. O.J. Simpson from 1994. The Collapse of Marion's Break from 1995. The Unabomber from 96. John Benet Ramsey of 96. Versace Killing Spree 97. The Mary Carey Lauderman's Forbidden Love of 98. The Columbine Massacre from 99. The Sad Saga of Andrea Yates from 2001. And the Theft of the scream from 2006 <gasps> i can breathe <laughs> wow all right that was that's a great place to start yes so there are, are a couple of these that jump out at me that right away in the first one i want to i want to go into is you you mentioned him that creepy fuck richard speck Oh God! Yes. So I just I want to do this one right away because I want to get him out of the way because this guy is a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. So for those that don't know, Richard Richard Benjamin Speck was born in nine or December sixth, so it's like close to his birthday when we're recording this. But nineteen forty one, he was. Um, uh, American mass murder was systematically tortured, raped, and murdered eight student nurses in Chicago uh, in the early morning, or actually it was mid evening because it was like when he broke into their. Okay, here here's kind of the story. I'm just going to kind of go off script because I know this story pretty well. Unfortunately, uh, Speck was just a piece of shit. Yeah, he was a low life thug. Uh, He's been in and out of jail for quite a few times, but I'm just going to center around what was deemed a, the crime of the century and then his comeuppance near the end. Right. So what, he was out drinking at a bar and he actually uh, was running out of money. He had, I mean, he had no job. He was a on again, off again merchant marine. So he would get out of vessel, find a way to get off it. He'd get paid, find a way to get off it, get back to the seaside, back to the States, drink his way back into stuff. When he ran out of money, he would uh, attack people. But this time he had an attack a, a bar patron there, took her up to a hotel room, uh, raped her, um, stole her money. It, but he said he would kill her if she said anything. So she didn't say anything. So he takes... The rest of the money that she has, he goes back down to the bar where he found her. He continues drinking. Well, he's a loudmouth braggart, but he was no, he was the typical little man syndrome because he was only like 130, 140 pounds. He was like five five, something like that. He's just a tiny, tiny man. But he ran out of money and needed to go find some, so he takes off. And he, when he was younger, he lived across the way from this boarding house that was for student nurses so he knew that there was a bunch of ladies there and he would only attack people that he knew he could overpower so he sneaks in into this place and you know he'd been drinking for a while so it's in the evening time now he goes in there um there's there's a rift in this house because like half of the, the women that live there are filipino and the other half are american and they had struggles against one another because the one half was paying to be there and the other ones were being paid to be there. So uh, he knew, or when he gets in there, he, <coughs> excuse me, he quickly overpowers the first lady he sees who's a, a Filipino lady, takes her back to her room where there's two more. He ties them up. Then uh, he hears somebody on the hallway, grabs her, takes her to a room, ties her up and he overpowers the six that are in the home, then two more come home later, he overpowers them. And then 
one at a time over the four out over four hours he rapes sexually molests or and murders each and every one of them right now they also had a friend spend the night that he did not see who yes. had hit under the bed and that's how he was caught because after he left she ran out screaming they're all dead he's they're all dead it, yeah um and she remembered a born to raise hell tattoo that was that he had that was i mean i'm sure it wasn't the greatest work ever i mean this is this is the yeah. 70s so richard speck ended up getting shot he ends up going to the hospital where this apb was put out on a small man who has a tattoo born to raise hell but he was it was the uh, arm i believe that was when they wiped the when he went to the hospital they wiped the blood off the orderly recognized the born to raise hell thing. They continued to treat him while they called the cops. The cops came in and arrested him in the, in the hospital. Right. Now I want to touch on why another reason why I say this guy is just a creepy motherfucker because during my research on him, I went to YouTube and I found some clips of him in prison. He has, I don't know if it was some sort of surgery or it's like chemical or something like that. But he now has breasts and walks around in women's underwear. And he's basically the queen of the cells. Yes, he was passed around from gang to gang. And that's how he spent the rest of his days until he finally, finally, and thankfully died of a heart attack at the age of 49. Yeah. But some of the other creepy shit that this motherfucker would do is he, uh, he was like in and out of like foster homes and stuff like that. And he was out and about, and he went to a former, like, a sibling of his, I believe it was. And when he, the one, the lady was walking by, she noticed that this creepy little dude was staring in her, in her uh, living room window. And she's like, ah! And it took her a minute to realize that who it was. But they allowed him to stay there for a little bit. <laughs> and it, a little bit means months. Right. All right. So... We got a lot to go over, so I think we should. That's that's enough attention to that piece of shit. Yeah, he died in '91. Almost, uh, he he died one day before his 50th birthday. Unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to uh, honestly avenge those nurses' uh, right. lives with that dead by dying. Right. Um, I'm gonna jump to the uh, Lana Turner affair in 1958. All right. Yeah. So everybody knows Lana Turner, famous actress from, you know, the 50s. She was a bombshell. She was blonde. She was, you know, um, what was that? The postman rings twice is what she's famous for. Right. Always rings twice or whatever. So she was a bit of, uh, she was a bit promiscuous for the time. She had seven different husbands, you know, m numerous boyfriends, but she would, she would get bored easily. And so she would, you know, jump from man to man to man. Well, she got involved with a mobster. Um, what's his name? Do you know? Um, I, I can look it up. I can grab it on my notes here real quick. I was just hoping not to have to turn any pages. Uh, uh, Johnny Stamp Stampatino? Stampanato. Stampanato. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they had a very, very tumultuous to say relationship he grew abusive with her because of the fact that she was afraid that she was going to step out on him and he was also a mobster yes she had a thing for dangerous men so one night you know on the night of april 4th 1958 they're in a horrible argument in their beverly hills home so violent in fact that her 14 year old daughter cheryl ran for a knife and ended up stabbing him to death hmm. So, you know, imagine that a 14 year old kid having to, you know, save her, if, kill her mother's boyfriend. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, that, that one right there is it, it, traumatic as hell for the kid, traumatic as hell for the, for the mom, um, kind of deadly for the guy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he kind of got what was, what he had coming to him. <laughs> It was yeah. It that one was a a weird one because I I knew who she was, but I didn't know anything about I didn't really know anything about this case. 
I didn't either until I did my research. You know, it was one of those ones I saw in that list from Time Magazine. Went, why not Turner Affair? You know, yes. I'm thinking, well, you know, I knew she was uh, um, around. We'll say, yeah. you know, she, that that part about her was always, you know, it's always been out there. It's always she's always been notorious for that. But when I when I read it as a fair, it's like, uh, didn't she have like a shitload of husbands? You know, right. what the fuck's that? I mean, really, she's cheating on somebody and that's that's there. But it was a different sort of affair. Right. Yeah. Because when I saw it, I was thinking, uh oh, another Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, that's just from the title. All right. So, you know, and we're going to kind of go through a lot of these quick because there's more that are on the list that we want to get into, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, one I want to I want to do really fast was the uh, the stealing of the Mona Lisa in 1911. Yeah, because that was uh, before this, um, if you don't know, which uh, you've probably been under a rock, Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa in 1507. Okay, right. it's arguably today the most famous painting in the world. Yeah, it's right up there with the scream and you it, know. It, exactly another painting which was heisted right but you know it i would say it's if it's not the most it is top five oh, yeah, definitely. Knows the definitely. Painting it was in it's been in countless movies uh you know she's got that weird smirk what she's smiling at is it is it da vinci himself in drag there's all these questions about the painting but small pp yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly because that's what I'm getting out of that look. <laughs> <laughs> um, before August 21st, 1911, this painting was relatively unknown. They knew it was a Da Vinci painting. They knew, you know, it was the Mona Lisa. It was in the Louvre where it resides today, but uh, it was stolen. And when the guy came out and said, the Mona Lisa was stolen, they went, what? <laughs> the what? So... The reason I want to just kind of roughly, or roughly go over this one real quick, I won't, won't go into too many of the details about it, but that heist of the Mona Lisa made it famous. Yeah. If it wasn't, it was like the uh, negative publicity of social media to the Kardashians today. It's what made, you know, sex tapes made them famous. Mm -hmm. this, this painting being stolen made it famous. Right. You know, it kind of goes along with that, that saying, there's no bad publicity. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And the irony of this is, you know, he, the guy who stole it was Italian mm -hmm. and he, and he stole it from France. And I'm not even going to try to say his name because I'm just going to slaughter it. So it's pointless. Yeah. Well, so he stole it, took it back to Italy and, and he was hailed as a patriot in Italy. And, but he was still found guilty of stealing it, but he only served a few months in jail because mm -hmm. apparently Patreon is also a refugee for art thieves. <laughs> oh. Nice. Did not know that. I like that part of it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I'm going to jump up from there to let's go uh, into the 70s, like uh, a couple years after I was born, and we got our, our, our old Patty Hearst kidnapping. Oh, right on. So I mean, I remember, I mean, I, I was two years old the year this happened, but I remember hearing about this a lot as I got older as a child. Mm -hmm. You know, cause, you know, it's, Patty Hearst was kidnapped. My, why is my, web, okay, there we go. All right. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. So she, on February 4th, 1974, she was 19 years old, and a ratty band of Bay Urban Revolutionaries, the Simonese National Liberal Army, kidnapped her and demanded a ransom for her. Now, yeah. she is like the um, epitome of Stockholm Syndrome. Yes. Because she kind of fell for her captors, and she was actually involved in a bank heist with them, I believe. Yes. You know, oh. and then she was captured... And she was, you know, put in jail, but she only served 22 months um, because Jimmy Carter let, it, let her out. And then Bill Clinton granted her a full pardon on the day he left office. Yeah. The, so the, the thing that I've, I've, 
I found doing kind of research on this one was there were multiple times that she was with them when they were do- going out and about that she was left alone in the van. <laughs> yeah. She could have left at pretty much any point after she was ca- after she was quote unquote kidnapped. Um, so it's it was she really a you know was it Stockholm syndrome? Was she really a member? Well, I mean, let's go into the psychological aspect of this. I mean, no, okay, I am not a psychologist, but you know, you think about this. So. For, what is it, two years? I've seen an episode of Dr. Phil. I know how to do this shit. Right. (laughs) For two years, she's held captive by these people. So it could be fear. It could be threats that they're going to kill her family. You know, it could be other things besides just, you know, hey, I want to be involved. I want to be with you guys. But it could also be, hey, this is fun. I'm going to fucking do this. Yeah. I mean, really, really no. Only she knows. And she was not the first of the greater Hearst family to be kidnapped or kidnapped. <laughs> right. and, uh, and, you know, it's the inter- another interesting part about her is um, she was a granddaughter of the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst, and he, who himself was the inspiration for Orson Welles' film Citizen Kane. Yes. Which I I like that too. I, that was a good movie. I really enjoyed that movie. Yeah. But I mean, well, so, there's a big flaw with that movie, though. There's a huge that? flaw with that movie. What's that? The whole movie. Okay, spoiler alert for those that haven't seen it. So you might want to earmuff yourself. But the whole movie is about what is Rosebud. Okay. <laughs> Nobody is in the in the room to hear him say his dying word, Rosebud. Right. So how the fuck can we have a movie about Rosebud when nobody heard it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it's Hollywood. We just yeah. make shit up. <laughs> so, was it all taking place in his own mind while he's dying? Who knows? It was, and Wells is even a bigger genius than we thought. Right. Oh, so where are we going next, Jason? Okay, so I'm going to kind of lump these three together. <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> the Son of Sam, John Wayne Gacy, and Ted Bundy. Yeah. Okay, I want to. I'm the reason I'm going to put them all kind of together is, and I'm not putting the Tate LaBianca murders with them because that that started something completely different, right? But, so, the son of Sam, John Wayne Gacy, and Ted Bundy were three of the most notorious serial killers in history. I mean, they're not the most prolific, they're not the most violent, they're not the most despicable, but they're three of the most famous because this was a time when the news was just starting to figure out what the, these multiple murderers are doing. They were just finally labeled what they're called being serial killers. This is the beginning at this time. It's what they call the golden age of, of serial killers, the, the late sixties to the early eighties. And this is still a time before uh, they, they had uh, cooperation between uh, police departments or the FBI with, in the ATF with the state, state and local uh, police departments, really because of these three particular, and there's, there's a couple others in there you could put in the Zodiac because they still don't know what he was and he right. did crimes in multiple areas, that they changed how police investigate these things. The FBI created what they call uh, the Behavioral Science Unit uh, the Mindhunter uh, series on Netflix is a, uh, a great uh, depiction of them creating that where they go and talk to different serial killers like uh, uh, Big Ed Kemper and right. a few others. But these three were notorious because they were the beginning of the news coverage covering this new brand of killer. They're the serial killer. Now these people, they're vile, they're evil, they're, they could be your next door neighbor. And that's what, that, the, these three were, in, were uh, in particular uh, different because one was a random killer running around 
net running around New York and just randomly shooting people. So nobody was safe. He put in 19, was it 70? Yeah, it was the summer of 76, 77. I don't remember which one it was, but he put the city on lockdown. One man walking around with a, with a revolver puts in a, the city of New York on lockdown. Then Gacy made it, it could be a solid citizen, your next door neighbor. He was an upstanding citizen. He had pictures taken with Jimmy Carter. You know, he was a contractor. He had a business. You know, he was a respected man. Didn't he also, like, dress up in a clown suit for kids and shit? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why he was kind of – one of his monikers is the killer clown, uh, Pogo, the killer clown. But so he was – now people are starting to like, okay, uh, there's a psycho that's running around that randomly that puts New York on lockdown. It's, it could be your neighbor next door. But then there comes Ted Bundy, who was, by all accounts, a very attractive man, a sweet talker, a very smart guy. You know, he was genius level IQ who could talk his way into every into any situation. He actually had a judge tell him when he was a he acted as his own attorney, it's a crime that I have to do this to you because it would have been an honor to have you in my courtroom as an attorney. So, <laughs> so that's why I put these three particular guys or these these cases together because they changed security they changed law enforcement and they changed america's mentality where the next thing i want to i, I kind of want to i'm going to roll right into the tape la bianca murders too because what they did th these three cases changed how you think about your neighbors they they kind of like ah you can't trust anybody stranger danger so right. all that stuff kind of came out of the fear of these three particular cases. And then there's the, the Richard Ramirez and the BTKs and those that came on that just kind of escalated this. But then before that was the Manson family and the Tate LaBianca murders. Right. Now, if you don't know this, the Tate LaBianca murders was uh, Leo LaBianca and his wife were the second set of murders. And then Sharon Tate and Abigail Folger and a couple others were murdered in another night and uh um uh, share and, shape. go ahead for, for those that don't that you know that don't that may not recognize the name sharon tate she was married to roman polanski the famous film director exactly who did rosemary's baby and then recently he did or not recently but a little while ago he was he directed ninth gate with uh with johnny depp um, he's still alive. He's still kicking. He lives in France because he can't come back to America because of another scandal with, involving an underage girl. But that's <laughs> not for this podcast. Right. So um, these particular murders, there are two sets of supposedly random murders. But when you get into it, you realize that the first one was um, the, I believe it was the La Biancas lived in the house that Manson thought one of the one of the uh, a record producer lived in, but he no longer lived there. Right, because he wanted to be a musician, and he was actually a really shitty musician. But he yes, couldn't... and he had a uh, um, one of the beat. He had uh, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. He they would hang out at his house. And he was trying to get this music career going so that he could spark his own revolution called Helter Skelter. But they did some brutal things to these people. They and they wrote a. Uh, Helter Skelter and pigs and all the other stuff in blood on the walls. I mean, there's, there's more heinous things that they did in these crimes, but. The most ahead. heinous would be the fact that Sharon Tate was eight and a half months pregnant when they killed her. Yes. And I mean, okay. she, she begged for the unborn, she begged for the life of her unborn child, but one of the women told her, look, bitch, I don't care about you. I don't care if you're having a baby, you're going to die. And I don't feel a thing about it. Exactly. Now, lesser known in that same thing was Abigail Folger, who was the heiress to the Folger's coffee uh, fortune. So she was also murdered at, in this thing. And then her boyfriend was there too. But uh, they were just all kind of hanging out with Sharon Tate because she was eight and a half months pregnant. And her husband was overseas directing a movie at the time. But the, the reason that this one is so important in history is because this officially killed the era of the hippie. Yeah. It, this was the ending of 
the the summer of love the you know summer of 69 all this yeah. died with the death of Sharon Tate and the LaBiancas the Folgers and all the rest of the victims in those those two cases I, I don't remember Brian Adams mentioned them in the song summer of 69 no I don't either I don't either <laughs> <laughs> I just remember something about the wafting of tuna fish or something. I don't remember what it was. Right. No, and you know, Manson, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about Manson because this man was fucking scary. He was he had he had, he had like Hitler esque charisma that, and like he people were just under his spell. Yes. And so, I don't know if um, you watched it, but there was, I don't remember what channel it was on, if it was on Netflix, but there was like a series with David Duchovny going out and inter- he was a cop trying to f- track oh, down. Aquarius. Me. Yeah. Age of Aquarius. Yeah. Good show. So the, the thing about Manson was he was another, like Richard Speck, he was a small guy. But the difference between somebody like Richard Speck and somebody like Manson was Manson sat back and observed and he spent more years in prison, not before he was even convicted of these murders where he spent the rest of his life in Sing Sing. He spent more of his life behind or incarcerated or in boys camps than he did free in the streets. But the one of the latest later, he was, uh, it was a car theft thing. I believe it was, but he ends up in prison and he, he actually learned a little bit about, actually, believe it or not, it was about Scientology. And he loved the structure of Scientology. He loved how they manipulated people in Scientology. He didn't get involved in, in, in that. He looked at how, how can I use this to control people? But right. then he came out and he learned how to control people and dominate people from actual pimps. When he was in prison... <laughs> He learned how to be a pimp, but he took it, what they were, what they said and how they dominated and controlled women, he did that to control everybody. So he combined the bullshit uh, torture tactics, mind torture tactics of Scientology and combined that with being a pimp. (laughs) And that's, that's what, that's the Manson we ended up with. Right. You at certain, at a certain level, you have to actually blame the system for putting him in a situation where he got to learn he did wasn't habilitated he was i mean he just like in the movie blow where he said i I walked in there with a i walked in with a bachelor's of of marijuana came out with a phd in coke he walked in there with a he walked in there with a bachelor's of con artistry he walked out a you know you know a phd level pimp (laughs) right yeah i mean he was he had so much control over all those people. It was just amazing. All right. So from there, I kind of want to go into something that um, wasn't on that list. Oh, sweet. Um, I want to talk about the uh, Adam Walsh um, murder. Awesome. Do you know about that? Yes, I, I, I know a lot about the Adam Walsh murder. Okay. What's his father's name? His father was on America's Most Wanted and actually helped catch thousands of criminals with his TV show. What was his? Yeah, his name is John Walsh. John Walsh, that's it. Yeah. So Adam Walsh, his kid, gets taken and killed, and a guy admits to doing it. His, blah, name, blah, blah, blah. his name was Otis Tool. Right. Yeah, and if you don't know who Otis Tool was, I'll, real quick. So this is, gonna, this is how uh, big – the death of Adam Walsh was Otis tool was the partner with notorious serial killer, Henry Lee Lucas. So these two were basically drifters from, they centered around the state of Florida mace or mostly, but they would travel around and they would just, they would do whatever the, whatever the hell they wanted. They were kind of like seeing lovers at the same time. And, but they would uh, rape or murder and kill and they drug along Otis's uh, niece with him for a long, a long period of time. But they got separated. And if you don't know who Henry Lee Lucas was, go back and watch the uh, Michael Rooker film, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. 
because it's loosely based off of the life of Henry Lee Lucas. And he was the, um, the first uh, celebrity uh, serial killer in the way that he started confessing to everything. If he heard somebody talk about a murder in the prison, he went and said, yeah, I did that. I did that. So he confessed to well over 3,000 murders in his career or in his life. Then they, they went on to, the two, two of them created this whole thing about the, they worked for a satanic cult in the, in Florida that had a worldwide reach called the hand of, that the hand of death. Well, and, but they got separated and there was a, there was time when Otis was just running around Florida killing people. And he just happens to pick up this boy at a mall and decapitates him, throws his body away. And it happens to be the, the son of John Walsh, who started his career, started by, you know, trying to find his son. But uh, there, there, I'll get, that's the backstory on Otis Tool. Um, I am, you see, this is where it gets really interesting because I watched quite a few different um, things on this today. And they never really came up with evidence to really say, you know, say, okay, yes, that's definitely Otis Tool is the killer. Right. Um, it's actually suspected that it could possibly be Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm. Um, because when he was picked up in the mall, they had video footage of it. They have footage mm. of this guy who was roughly the size, the build, everything of Jeffrey Dahmer in a white van, mm. grabbed this kid and physically threw him inside the van, roughly. Yeah. Okay? Grabbed him in the mall, grabbed him by the arm, dragged him out, and then threw him in there. And it took off. So it's possible. It could have been Jeffrey. I mean, either way, somebody killed this poor kid. And it yeah. you know, spurred John Walsh to you know, do the show and all that other stuff. But, I mean, and this wasn't listed on the time thing, but it's a horrendous murder. Uh, yeah. and, but the – so because, like, what you and I talked about at the beginning of this, it's like – we gotta we gotta step it up and get something a little bit more lighthearted next week because a lot of these are you know horrific crime. <laughs> so I'm trying to find a a happy ending to a lot of these. So John Walsh lost his son in this, but from that, through his efforts, he created a group that turned into another group that turned into another group that eventually became the Center for Exploited Children or displaced and exploited children. So if you don't know what that is, um, they're an advocate group that tries to find missing children all over the, anytime they go missing. But if you watch the very popular show, Live PD, when they do the missing child thing each week, during, or during that, they bring a lady on from the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And that's a foundation that John Walsh started. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, I mentioned Jeffrey Dahmer. Why don't we just get right into Jeffrey? All right. The crazy fucking alcoholic cannibal. Right. <laughs> and ironically, when I was researching the Richard Speck stuff, it was it kind of similar. Uh, he didn't want to get killed like Dahmer did in prison. That's why he got the boobs and became basically a prostitute. <laughs> right, right. So... Jeffrey, 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 Jeffrey. I fucking hate you, Jeffrey. That was that was a quote from uh, one of the victims in the victims panel during Jeffrey's sentencing. I hate you, Jeffrey Dahmer. I fucking hate you, Jeffrey Dahmer. You motherfucker. <laughs> it it's a very very uh, it's I hate using the word very, but I said it twice, which is even worse. Watch that on YouTube. Uh, this lady of one of his victims just goes off in the court and they have to actually physically drag her, drag her out. And she's a big lady. I would not want to mess with her. So they should have just set up a cage with Jeffrey and her and let him go. Right. So Jake right to the death. <laughs> it's like celebrity death match. Exactly. Only not claymation. <laughs> right. Pay-per-view. And I'm sorry. I know these are really sad topics for me to be making jokes of and making light of, but man, I just spent two weeks researching Hitler and then a week researching this stuff and it's fucking depressing and I got to do something to bring it up. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we're talking uh, about Jeffrey. 
Don't. What did what did Jeffrey do? Oh, as I fucking learned, forgot how to drink there and spilled shit all over myself. I, mean, I look like I pissed myself. Anyway, okay, so I forgot the number of people that Jeffrey was eventually uh, convicted of, but Dahmer was a loner. He wasn't really – see, Jeffrey's a weird case because when you start listening to uh, a lot of these different serial killer cases, they, they all pretty much start out the same. He was a loner. He was a bedwetter. He started fires. He blah, blah. You know, it's like just fucking – Jeffrey actually lived in an okay family. His, uh, his parents did divorce, and Jeffrey got into, you know, he was, he put on a, sh a face in front of people. He was actually, uh, a lot of people considered him the class clown when he was in high school. Huh. But, you know, so he was a little bit different in that regard. But, uh, and there's a, a comic book series called uh, um, My Friend Dahmer. That's was done by somebody that knew Jeffrey back in the day. So they wow. kind of, it's like kind of a series of, you know, him, what he was like back then, but he, you know, he experimented, he started with, uh, you know, killing of animals in the woods. Just it's, there's a McDon thing called the McDonald triad. The reason I mentioned the fires and the bedwetting, usually animal cruelty, bedwetting and starting of fires are three things that, um, it's called the McDonald triad. And it, those are the three points that if you have those things, then generally you're going to end up a serial killer. It's not a real testament to a person's psychosis or mental state, but it's just, it's three common traits that you find out. But Dahmer was, an, he was cruel to animals. And then he killed his first victim when he was only like 18 years old. He, he, this was still in Ohio. He, he killed him with a, he brought this kid back to his grandma's house and um, wanted to party and ended up like, wanted, he was, he was a closet homosexual and he hated himself for having homosexual tendencies. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to have all of the fun of being a gay man without anybody knowing it was. So that's why he ended up killing his first victim. Right. Yeah. And, Back in 91 in Milwaukee, he was almost caught because um, he had a 14-year-old Asian male with him that was drunk, and the guy, act, you know, was able to escape and with him in pursuit, and then the cops came up, and they started asking questions, and Dahmer was able, in talking about how, you know, how he was different from everybody, he was able to talk them into, you know, you know, hey, he was able to convince them that it's just a lover's quarrel, and so they, they returned the you know, because the, the guy was also naked that ran off. So, yeah. and it was a toxic Asian male, so they gave him back to him to, like, you know, just go take care of him, you know. <laughs> and that was just it. His, his victim of choice were either, they were always poor, they were either African American, Asian, or Latino. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I don't know, maybe they taste better. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So what made Dahmer uh, rise to the level of notoriety was when he was finally busted. They found human skulls that were painted up. They found body parts in his fridge. They found some, some in a cooking pot on his stove. Uh, they found jars of male genitalia. They found jars of other shit all over. 55 gallon drums of acid with bodies in them. Uh, it was so bad that the city actually relocated all the other residents in the apartment building and bulldozed the place. Good. But he was, they, and they do that a lot with those, those type of uh, uh, places after they're done investigating and there's nothing else there. They just knock it down. Right. Um, yeah. And you know, here, he was sentenced to nearly a thousand years in jail, but he only served three years because then he was killed by an inmate in 94. And the reason it took, okay. The reason it took that long for an inmate to kill him was it wasn't like days before that he was released into general pop. Right. Before that he was in solitary confinement and then they released him to the general population and he was almost instantly killed. 
kind of like recently, uh, if you paid attention to the news, uh, Whitey Bulger, who was the uh, Johnny Depp character from the movie Black Mass, he was a real mobster from Boston who killed a whole bunch of people, then went on the lam and for 18 years was second on the most wanted list, uh, FBI's most wanted list, right next to Osama bin Laden. So apparently the FBI can't find anybody that's on that list because this man <laughs> was in Palm Springs, of all places, just living. He didn't even change his name. He was just in Palm Springs with his girlfriend. They finally found him, put him there. They, uh, they moved him to a penitentiary in West Virginia, and he was brought there. I believe it was on Sunday, Monday morning, they found him dead. Surprise, surprise, yeah. surprise. So very, very similar if you do heinous things. It's, it's a weird prison thing that they take care of child molesters and they take care of uh, people like Dom. Right. Um, I'm going to jump up to 1994 because this is all I want to say about this case because I don't, I, I'm so sick of it. And it's the OJ Simpson. Okay. OJ killed his ex Nicole Simpson and her then boyfriend, Ronald, whatever his name is. Goldman. Um, and to me, the crime part of the century is, yeah, he did it. He got away with it. They set him free because of the glove don't fit. You must have quit. But the, the true crime, besides the murders, which was a crime, was the media shoving that shit down our fucking throat for a year and a half. They started a whole network because of that case. The crime TV, or court TV, rather. Court TV yeah. started because they, of the coverage of that case. And that is a more heinous crime. And they gave us Nancy fucking Grace. Yeah. And Greta Van Susteren. That was fucking twats. Uh, anyway, yeah, I agree with you. Everybody knows that case. Yep, so fuck OJ. He doesn't even rank up there in the time of the century. Nope. We won't even yeah. give him that satisfaction. Nope. I'm going to let you go next. All right, so... <clears throat> I have to touch on the Unabomber. I figured you would. <laughs> All right. So, Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what do we know about the Unabomber? The Unabomber – oh, go ahead. Well, the year was 1996. <laughs> <laughs> there was a gentleman who lived out in the mountains of Montana. Yes. And you can go from there. <laughs> All right. there's a lot of peculiar things that happen with this case so real fast about what the case was if you don't remember a bunch of different random packages were being sent to people around the country and they're blowing up and killing a couple people and hurting a lot um, now the first thing I'm going to touch is if, please while, while I'm talking about this I want you to google the Unabomber um, uh, a sketch, the art or the police sketch of the Unabomber. You'll see it. It's got the 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 Unabomber has the the sunglasses. He's got the hoodie on, and everybody knows this. Everybody who knows the case knows that sketch. Okay, I'm working. Not, on so, uh, not so fun fact about this sketch was it. Ha okay, so. There was a package that was placed in a, a parking lot in front of a like a strip mall, and a lady who saw the person put the package there looked through the window, saw the Unabomber, placed the package next to a car, and then minutes later, it ex somebody kicks the package and explodes. Uh, I don't remember if it killed or hurt somebody. So she saw the Unabomber for approximately 30 seconds at most. She sits down with a police sketch artist, and uh, they come up with a sketch. Years later, when the FBI really gets involved, they have her sit down again. Now, the first sketch artist, she sat down with for two hours. And they, they did this whole sketch. So when they redid the whole sketch, she sits down for another, I don't remember how long she sat down with the next one, but describes in detail the Unabomber. But then when it comes out, it gets put out into the press. The, uh, it's on all media channels. It's on the cover of Time Magazine. It's on the cover of uh, Wall Street Journal. It's everywhere. 
But then the original sketch artist that sat down with her two hours to do the original one goes, oh, that's funny. Holds up the picture next to him. It's him. She spent two hours with the artist. She described the artist, <laughs> not the Unabomber. So we spent yeah. years with this sketch looking for the man who was the artist of the drawing. The original drawing was much, much closer. Right. I'm Because uh, I'm like holding it up going, yeah, don't look anything like him. <laughs> it, 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 no, it, it doesn't. But it, it, there's a funny picture of the uh, of the original sketch artist holding the composite <laughs> next to it. They're identical. It's like twins, except for one's black and white. Right. But, and so, the thing with, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to go into another part that I thought was interesting. You know, I just kind of want to touch on, because this is kind of a common tra trait with a lot of these people that we're talking about. Ted Kaczynski was extremely intelligent. Yes. He was also, okay, this is where you go down to, yeah, he was a recluse. He's kind of a loner. He is was a definition of recluse loner. Yes. So I'm going to let you go back to what you were going to say now. No, I'm glad you brought up how intelligent he was. He was, and one account I saw, he had an IQ of 164. I don't know if you, if average is 100. Genius level is between 130 and 140. And then and you have the Trump level, which is like 30. Yeah. So, exactly. So, in this, he's about six and a half times Trump. Right. <laughs> so, actually, a uh, side story. I was watching a, a show about the Unabomber one night, and they kept saying, it's, oh, you has got an IQ 164. I go, fuck that. I'm better than that. So during the commercial break, I took an online IQ test and I only got 131. So yes, Ted was a little bit smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, the guy was a, he was a, described as a reclusive mathematician. Yes. And which, which is surprising because a lot of his bombs, as intelligent as he was, and being a mathematician, a lot of his bombs didn't work so good. No, no, they didn't. He wasn't an engineer. He was a mathematician. Right. Well, it's like he had one on a plane that just kind of, instead of blowing up, just caught shit on fire. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the, the thing with Ted was, and this is Kaczynski, not Bundy, he, he was like, if you remember the show Doogie Hauser, where Doogie Hauser was like a 16 year old doctor, he was also 16 years old, or it was 14 or 16. He was, at, he was an actual student at Harvard. Not like a running start thing. He was an honest to God student at going to Harvard University or the University of Harvard, whatever you would call it. Uh, so he, when he was there, his professor said, well, he's kind of a loner. He's young. He, he was like, I want you to uh, come along. And we're, we're doing this ex these experiments. And I think you'll be a great test subject. So when he was there, he was subjected to uh, mind experiments and uh, – other um, experiments on, on your consciousness. And if you want to know more about what this program was called, it was called MK Ultra. MK Ultra was a mind control experiment run by the CIA. And there was multiple deaths. It's where, uh, if you've ever seen the movie, the, uh, the Manchurian Candidate. And that's kind of where they were trying to do with MK Ultra. We talked about it in another episode. We were talking about uh, um, psychic powers and shit like that. The Minister right. of Goats that kind of came out of that whole program. But Ted Kaczynski was actually a full-fledged subject in MK Ultra. So did those experiments and shit twist his already fragile mind because he was so young at that time? And that, that made him grow this hatred that he had towards technology and his hatred and fear towards technology um, brought him to get into verbal altercations with his brother all the time. And he used to scream and holler and rant about all this, these particular little things about oh, technology is going to bring down or we don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, just, he didn't say blah, blah, blah. He said a lot of other like, really eloquent words that I'm not going to try to do it because I just <laughs> told you that Ted Kaczynski's IQ was way, way bigger than mine. So anyway, long story short, he writes this 31, 34 page manifesto that it's gets, 35,000 words. Yes. <laughs> so he writes this manifesto and it was all about, uh, how essentially 
essentially the uh, the manifesto was about how uh, we if we keep down the path that we're going to do, we're going to end up in a uh, Terminator type of situation where the machines run everything. That was kind of his biggest fear. So he was very vocal about saying, you know, blah blah blah, all this shit. You know, he likes again. He didn't say blah blah blah, but he was he would spew this stuff constantly to his family. So when he released this, the FBI um, tried to figure out how they could figure out who wrote this thing. So they bring in a, uh, a guy that was a language expert, a linguist. So uh, he noticed that there were things within the letters that the Unabomber sent and within this manifesto where they weren't misspellings of different words. They were just old versions of spellings of different words. So um, I forgot, I, I'm, it's, it's escaping me which words they were, but they were just old English versions of, of these different spellings. And he used them and used those in different phrases repeatedly. So they started going back and they started looking at different, um, uh, they started looking at different writings from different people about these, how, you know, who would, what part of the country, what part of the world would actually spell stuff this way. So this linguist put together a whole profile of what the potential Unabomber would be. But then when they, they decided, you know what, fuck this, we're just going to release the entire manifesto and the New York times and a bunch of other newspapers printed it in its entirety. Well, didn't he demand that they, that they publish it or he was going to blow up a plane over Los Angeles? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He demanded that, but they were, they were relenting on it. They didn't, they didn't want to, the FBI didn't want to uh, give into the demands of a terrorist, but they finally did. And when they got a phone call from, of all people, Ted Kaczynski's sister-in-law, she read the manifesto and went, Oh my God. She waited for her husband to get home and she goes, the Unabomber is your brother. And he's like, what? So she goes, no, read this. So she made him start to read the manifesto and goes, holy shit, it is. So they called the FBI. And then from, from the, they got papers from, uh, from the Unabomber, or they, they got papers from Ted's old writings. They started comparing them to that. They found that the same phrases and the same type of spellings of these rare words were the same. So they go, oh my God, we got our guy. So they right. went plotting. And then that linguist who actually put the case together was actually bumped aside and some other people took credit for it. Right. And that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> is how the Unabomber was caught. Yes. All right. In about 35,000 words. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to jump up to 1995. And here we have the, the collapse of the Barings Bank. Now, right. the Barings this is another one that I didn't know much about. I didn't either, but it was really interesting because the Bar the Barings Bank, for those of you who don't know, was the biggest bank in London, and even it's they they were considered a royal bank because the Queen even had her money in the Barings Bank. Oh wow! So they they hire this guy, this Nick Leeson, and uh, Nick Leeson was kind of a swindler. He uh, he he started playing with their money and put, he bankrupted the bank and was convicted of fraud and I mean it can't, they came to more than one billion in amount the bank could not cover and it so it collapsed and then it was end up the bank was actually bought by a Dutch financial company for one British pound. But <laughs> he, he flee and then he was actually to Singapore where years for fraud and now he's a manager of a soccer team in scotland but he he fooled derivatives in the market and so they stationed him in Singapore, and it's, he started betting on market shifts around the world using the bank's money and oh. you know at one point his speculations counted for 10 percent of bearing's profits and they just thought this guy's awesome he's a star but then he started going a little bit deeper a little bit deeper and just getting it I equate it to somebody playing craps and they just can't get enough. I got to bet more. I got to bet more. I got to bet oh, more. Right. You know, and so this guy, like I said, they send him to prison. You know, he served six and a half years for fraud while in prison, wrote a book, 
called Rogue Trader, and um, they actually have a movie based off the book starting, um, is it Ewan McGregor, Owen McGregor, one of the McGregors, but so this guy basically took the Queen's money and just ran with it. <laughs> it's definitely interesting. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Why do I keep repeating the same word? But... Um, yeah, so now you can find him in Scotland as a manager of a football team, as they call him, and everybody else just looked at him going, great, just great. Um, but yeah, and now I'm just rambling, I believe. So I'm going to jump away from the collapse of the Barrings Brink, and I'm going to jump into Mary Kay Lauderman's Forbidden Love of 1998. And for those of you that don't know, Mary Kay I'm gonna. I, I'm slaughtering names left and right. But Mary Kay Letter News, Forbidden Love. She was a teacher, and she had a student whose name was Billy Fulau. I believe he's like Puerto Rican or Filipino or something. And she was his teacher in the second grade. Now, she met him in second grade, and then when he was in sixth grade, she started flirting with him. Then when he turns. Then the next year, he turns 13, and she starts having sex with him. Now, she's already the mother of four people from a marriage that was disintegrating, um, but she ended up getting pregnant and having his daughter before she ended up in prison on rape and molestation charges. Um, so she ended up getting probation, and, you know, they said part of her probation is she couldn't see this kid anymore, but Mary didn't care. No, so, no, she didn't. Mary so, didn't do what Mary wants because Mary just says, fuck her old family. I'm going to fuck a little kid. Right. So she is caught again with him. And while, and she's thinking, okay, if I get caught, you know, maybe they'll just give me a year. No, the judge was pissed. Judge says, you're going to prison for seven years. Mm -hmm. And they find out she's pregnant again. Yeah. <laughs> and so... She did her seven years. She was released on parole in 2004, and then the two got married. So yeah. for some reason, this kid, wait, and at this point, he's now 21. Right. So for some, this is, this is just a completely fucked up situation. How do you meet somebody when they're in second grade? You're what, eight, nine years old? Yeah. How do you meet an eight or nine-year-old and go, I love that kid. I want to marry oh, him. I'm going to groom that. I'm going to yeah. groom that shit. And I mean, I've seen, I watched interviews of the two of them together. Yeah, it's yeah. creepy. Yeah, because Barbara Walters loves interviewing these two. <laughs> it, fuck, it was creepy. It was creepy as shit. Listen, listen to that. It, you know, okay, growing up, every little boy and even some of the little girls have had a crush on one of their teachers. But, you know, I don't think any of one of them has ever had that, you know, they had that little crush or, you know, when they kiss or you know, even more if they were older. But none of them have ever said, you know what? Damn, I can't wait to have two of her kids. <laughs> right. I'm going to wait for that one. Oh, man, I'm going to wait seven years to get married to that one while I raise her kids outside while she's in prison. Oh, well, my parents raise her kids outside while she's in prison because I'm too young. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm i going to have a moment of truth here real quick. Um, while I was talking about the collapse of the Bering's Brink and the reason why I just kind of stuttered and fell apart because Jason had to go pee. <laughs> so Jason stepped away for a minute. And so I – he wasn't here to bail me out when I was struggling. <laughs> that's why I jumped so quick to Mary Kay. I could talk oh, that's fine. I, I, we were going to jump to Mary Kay Letourneau eventually. <coughs> yeah. So while we're uh, kind of in, in flux here. So when I was going through this, I found a lot of other things in pop culture that are referred to as crime of the century. Okay. And – some of these things I thought were, were kind of cool. Uh, and some of them are kind of kind of tragic. Like the, the Cheap Trick album? Yeah. One is the Super Tramp album, 1974. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the like... Super Tramp, yeah. Yeah. Bloody Well Right. You're right. You're right. You're bloody well right. <coughs> bloody you got a bloody right to say. <clears throat> yeah. So everybody knows that song. If you don't, go look, go Spotify it, YouTube it, do something. It's a good song. Good yeah. album, actually. 
another one, it was a song from the musical Ragtime. Now, I don't really know. I'm not a musical theater major. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know much about musicals. Uh, other than like the old MGM movies, you know, I've seen, I've been to plays, I've seen musicals, but I don't know anything about ragtime. Um, I don't either. So another one was referred to as a crime of the century. This one was kind of a tragic in a different way. Uh, Mike, and I'm going to slaughter his name. I think it's Amon, Amon. Okay. Uh, he was a soccer player and he was a professional soccer player and he got hurt. Well, they brought in a they brought in this doctor to uh, that to surgically repair his the damage that he had, but the doctor had never performed that procedure before. He's a prof- professional athlete, professional soccer player, and his career was over after the yeah. surgery because the the doctor botched it and ended his ended his career. And they in the soccer world they refer to it as the crime of the century. Then going back to uh, 1933, there was a movie. It was an American uh, pre-code ther- uh, thriller directed by uh, uh, William uh, Beardine. <laughs> that uh, that it was a about a bank official who whom a doctor had early hypnotized to obtain money from the bank's vault was found murdered. Ooh. Yeah, uh, another crime of the century movie ni- in 1946. This one was uh, Hank Rogers re- is released from prison after serving serving time for a minor crime. Hank arranges, arranges to meet his brother Jim, a newspaper reporter, in a bar where Hank is distracted by an attractive Audrey Brandon. His brother doesn't show up in a, at Jim's apartment. Audrey drugs his drink and renders Hank unconscious. So that's Crime of the Century. There's a Mexican movie called Guyana, Crime of the Century. It's also called uh, Guyana, Cult of, of the, Cult of the Damned which is a movie about uh, the, the Jonestown Massacre, the Jim Jones Massacre, which was <clears throat> one that should be on our list, which wasn't. If you don't, quickly about that, uh, the People's Temple was a church in uh, San Francisco. They uprooted, went down to uh, French Guyana, uh, started this whole uh, compound down there, and they ended up killing, um, what was his name, Leo, uh, Leo Ryan. He was a uh, Congressman that went down there after complaints of people were saying that they were being held against their will. Uh, they ended up killing the, they ended up killing the congressman, and then they all drank cyanide uh, laced Kool Aid, where the phrase "drink the Kool Aid" came from was 900 plus people, and ultimately died that day. Whether it was some say suicide, some say they were forced to drink. So, right. well, uh, and you know, they also don't talk about the whole. Waco, Texas, and you know what was his name? Um, David Koresh. Yes, David Koresh. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that weren't listed, like um, the uh, assassination of you know JFK, um, the murder of Bobby Franks, the DC sniper, but that's in 2000. So um, 9/11. Yeah, yeah, also in 2000s. But, I mean, we also, like the Craigslist killer, the Tylenol murders. You remember when her parents terrified to buy Tylenol? Yeah, yep, I remember that. Yep. I mean, all these stuff, things weren't talked about at all. I mean, they weren't on the Time magazine list. Apparently, they weren't good enough to make the cut. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that didn't make the cut is the Holocaust. Yeah, that's definitely a crime of the century. Yeah. <laughs> um, but let's jump up to the very last year of the century with the Columbine Massacre. All right. So we've got these two kids that decided they're going to take school shootings to a whole new level. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Yes. And they – I am I mean, they they had planned this out. They had been talking about it forever. They, they – they, were try- they went out and tried to get guns on their own, but were underage, so they couldn't get them. So they had to find somebody else to get them guns, which they did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've watched way too much shit on this in the last two days that I don't I, – I'm not going to be able to sleep without medication. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get this out of the way. The, one of the first things that came out, out about these two was – because they went after jocks and cheerleaders, so they were bullied. No, 
These two were the bullies. Yes. Okay. Eric Harris was a sociopath. Yes. He was clinically diagnosed as a sociopath. He was not a good kid and probably should have been somewhere else. Yes. Uh, Dylan Klebold was a little bit different because he was more of a follower of Air, of Harris's, but he's still pretty fucking evil to, to go through with all this. Right. And, you know, uh, at the time this happened, everybody wanted to blame it on bullies or outsiders or teen goth culture or music or video games. The, who, the reality of it is, who's really to blame are the parents, the teachers, and stuff like that, who all saw, saw signs of all this shit. Yes. Well, not the parents, because they did what they were supposed to. They reported to the police who misplaced the files. Mm. And nice. also, you know, the police were outside the library that they end up killing themselves in. Yes. The doors of the library were open. They're killing people in the fucking library and the police are staying outside doing yeah. that. There's, if you watch the, the news footage of it, there's this, uh, this <clears throat> I'm going to bash on the, uh, um, on the cops and how they handled this because <clears throat> excuse me, Harris walks out of the doors outside and walks back in. They just start open firing at him. They're firing indiscriminately into a school where they can't see past the first couple of feet. They don't know if Harris is still there. They don't know if other children are are there. They just bam, 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 just indiscriminately start firing. They didn't start firing until he went back in the building. And you know, this is almost just a mirror image of the most, one of the more recent ones, the Parkland shootings. Mm -hmm. You know, where again, police were outside doing nothing. Yeah. You know, and then you have the, you know, the pumpkin king going, well, I would have run in there. I, we all know that to not be true because the man's a big fucking coward, but I mean, I tell you what, if I was running there, anywhere, unless it's for a buffet, right. Or a KFC. Um, but if I were there, hey, they got if, waffles now, right? If I were there, I would have run in. If I was a cop there, I would have been going in trying to figure something out. I know it's against protocol, but there are fucking kids dying. Yes. You know, if I have to sacrifice my life to save a couple of kids, I would do it. Just like that teacher did. Yes. The teacher that died, he deserves so much praise for saving the lives of tons of children. Yes. That man is a, that man's a saint, and they should name a street after him in that town. Yes, you know. But the the other thing too is the standoff went hours, and right. they had a, the opportunity to continue walking around, just randomly shoot kids as they're as they're sitting there, as they're cowering, as they're hiding under benches and tables and whatever. And then finally, they eh, you had enough. Yeah, I had enough. Okay. Boom. Then they end up killing themselves. Right. And, you know, in the, uh, like they were interviewing kids and they're like, the, the kids heard them when they came in a library saying, you know, just look for the ones with the white hats because the jocks would wear white hats at the time. Mm. It was the trend. And it's like one of the kids had, took his hat off and put it inside his shirt. Nice. But when they, when they got to the, to the school, because this is, this is the true irony of this whole situation. One kid, I can't remember his name, but um, I think it was Harris had threatened to kill, said he was going to kill him before all this went down. His parents reported it to the police. Oh, yeah. And they did nothing about it. And when they got to the school, that kid was outside having a cigarette. And I guess, uh, no, it was... It was either, I can't remember which one it was. But anyways, I said, you know what? Because apparently they they created a rapport after that, after mm -hmm. the, him threatening him. And he's like, you know what? I like you now. Get out of here. Yeah. He's like, he's like, leave. Go home now. And so the kid took off. <laughs> and then all hell broke loose afterwards. Right. But they had uh, – so you kind of have to put a little of the blame on uh, Harris's parents. 
because that kid had an arsenal of bombs and shit in his room. Yeah. Now, I raised a teenager. You've raised teenagers. You know, I'm not always 100% up on what's in their room, but when you take laundry in there or whatever, you know, you just kind of like look around a little bit, just not pick up shit and, you know, you don't get intrusive, but. Right. You're just like, you know, where's the supply of goddamn propane canisters in his bedroom? Right. You know, because every parent has done this. I got to, I'm missing dishes. Where the fuck are they? So you go in your kid's room looking for dishes. Yeah. (laughs) You know, when you're looking for dishes, they hide that shit. You got to go through shit. Yeah. (laughs) You're going go in there and say, "Oh yeah, like you said, you got a propane tank." Hey, where the fuck all these guns come from? <laughs> right? Because he Which, had apparently he had boxes of ammo under his bed. Yeah, and you know all these people are going, "Well, it's Second Amendment, right?" Blah blah blah. Yep, you're part of the problem. Yeah, you know because. Columbine should have taught us everything we needed to know about school shooters, and we should have done made steps at that point to stop that from happening again. Yes. But what did we do? We made it easier for them to get guns. Yeah, because we didn't think of the victims. We thought of them. It, it there was there's a couple arguments that came out of that. I I fuck that train of thought. I'm going to go down to another avenue. One of the dumbest train of thoughts or uh, avenues that came out of that was we need to arm these teachers. These teachers need to have guns. Yeah. No, 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 no. Well, if they would have a gun, that shit wouldn't happen. It, it could have made it easier. Yeah. Because cause now see- the argument you have to think about is how many of your, how many of your teachers have you seen after you graduated or after you're out of middle school and you come back and now you're, you're fucking growing that you realize it's like, Oh man, that dude's short. Oh man. He's really tiny. I remember when we were the same height. Now I'm like 300 pounds more than she is. You don't want a person who's not qualified to handle a gun or a person that is, you know, that can easily be overtaken in a situation like that, because now you're bringing the gun to the school. Right. Some of these kids could easily overpower these, these, uh, these other teachers. And, you know, they know they have a gun, so they don't have to bring one to school because they're already fucking there. Right. And not to mention the fact that, okay, there's so many arguments against this, you know, okay. For one, you're asking a teacher to kill somebody they care about. Right. You're at, and what happens when the teacher gets shot? Are you expecting one of the students to pick up the gun to protect everybody? Exactly. Or what are you going to do when that gym teacher earlier this year flipped out and start, had a gun in school and was shooting? You know, I've talked to a bunch of teachers that, I mean, they jokingly say, oh, I'd love to kill that kid. I'd love to kill that kid. But, you know, there's a lot of teachers here. There just may be one that might actually do it. Right. And fuck Betsy DeVos and Bear's argument. Because <laughs> she is just the dumbest bitch on the face of the planet. <laughs> but, you know, you also, I mean, earlier this year, there was also a second grader that took a gun off a cop who was in the school. Yes. And then here in the area I live, our lovely sheriff was in a school, a, a junior high school, you know, in elementary school, it was one of the two, for some sports thing, changed in the bathroom, and it was on a Saturday. On Monday morning, a sixth grader found his gun in the fucking bathroom. All right. The first question I need to ask about that was, at when, when do you realize that you're missing your gun? Especially as a cop when it's your yeah. job. To have it. You're a sheriff. Well, he said um, it was his backup piece. I don't care. You should get home. It's like a uh, gun one, gun two, because that shit should be locked up, put away. You know, you're a police officer. You're supposed to be trained to know how to take care of a weapon. You should at least know, you know, oh, geez. I mean, thank God it was a responsible kid that found the gun and immediately got a teacher to come take care of it. Right. You know, yeah, bless that child, but it could have. And, and you know what happened to the cop? 
Absolutely nothing. Uh, probably, yeah. It was a mistake. Well, yeah, because he's a white man. He's getting away with it. But, you know, I've there's mistakes that I can make at work that would get me fired, too. Yeah. Yeah, if I forgot a gun in a school, I'd be in jail. <coughs> right. Three minors. <laughs> All right, let's go somewhere else because this is just pissing me right now. Yeah, we're getting down another. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do um, – if you want us to do a whole gun control episode, let us leave, know. Leave comments in the, uh, on our leave messages on Twitter and, and uh, Instagram. Right. Or if there's a there's a topic you'd like us to hear us talk about, again, message us on Twitter or Instagram. Or email right. us at the bunny rabbit hole at gmail.com. Right. So right. um let's go back to this one's kind of funny. Let's go to the fake ape man. Oh, yeah. This is from 1912. No one got – we're going to do one where no a crime where nobody got hurt. <laughs> uh, so, in 1912, they found the remains of an ape man. Dun, dun, dun. Bum, 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 bum. And they said that this ape man was 375,000 years old. And it put England in contention for a cradle of humankind because it was found in the Sussex town of Piltdown. They, they called him the first Englishman. He was proudly called when the anthropologist Charles Darwin found him in 1911. So, A. A. Dawsoni. 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 That was a scientific name of it. It was the alleged missing link. <clears throat> now, None of us truly knows if we've evolved from apes or what happened. There's so many theories about it. Then you have the religious fanatics saying, no, no, everything's bullshit. Evolution doesn't happen. But if evolution doesn't happen, people wouldn't be getting bigger all the time, and we wouldn't be getting smarter all the time. And we wouldn't be getting flu shots. And uh, we'd have a cure for the common cold. Because right. why, why would we have to do that? Because that shit evolves. It changes. Right. That's, that's right. evolution. Maybe so, on a smaller scale, but it's still evolution. So for years and years and years, they thought, that, they thought, hey, this is it. We've got it. But then in 1953, fragments, including the jawbone, were finally tested. Because, okay, let's be realistic. In 1912, they didn't have the scientific shit to do all this. <laughs> they didn't have the scientific shit in 1979 either. Right. But this was in 1953. Um, the fragments, including the jawbone, were tested, and they found they did not contain enough fluorine to be the, the age that Dawson claimed worse, the jawbone was that of a 10-year-old orangutan. With its, oh. teeth, its teeth were ground down to simulate age, and a crude chemical wash was applied to the bone to make it appear ancient. <laughs> Nobody knows who, who you know, was behind the hoax, because um, Dawson had died in 1916. So, very quickly, the Piltdown became a synonym for phony, and England's claim to antiquity was cut short by several hundred thousand years. No, Poor but, yeah. but so, I mean, think about the, the brilliance of that, though, to create something like that, and to, back then, when you don't have much technology, but to know how to age this shit. It, yeah, that, that's a good point. That is, it's... <coughs> You see this at, at fairs and at circuses and sideshows all the time where it's like, oh, come, you know, come see this law, the missing link. Come see the yeah. ape woman. Come see. They, they do a lot of shit in taxidermy where they, they, you know, they make new animals. Like, you know, everybody knows the jackalope. Right. And, and whatever. But for this to go down from 1912, and it's not officially disproven until 1954. 53. 53. So. So 42 years. Yeah. 40, you know. 43 years. 41 years. Sorry. Yeah. So for four decades, people believed that this was real. I'd say, I don't say that's a crime of the century. I say the, I think that's fucking genius. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, right now, I mean, if you were to think about it today's age, it'd be no problem to sit there and fake something like that. Because of the technology we have, because of the knowledge we have, because of, I mean, anybody can figure out 
I mean, you can figure out how to do anything off fucking YouTube, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so this guy knew to take, well, okay, I want to back up a little bit. Not everybody has access to a 10-year-old orangutan jawbone. Right. So first of all, he had to get that. Then he had to get the idea of going, huh, what can I do with the jawbone? You know what? I'm going to change the world. You know, most people look at a jawbone and go, damn, that's spooky. Or, ugh, that's right. disgusting. This man's going to change the world, and I'm going to put my name on the map. Right. So yeah, what, right. Can I, what can I do? I'm going to file the teeth down. I'm going to do, you know, I'm sorry. The, the there's certain up, crimes that are crimes, but then there's hoaxes like this to, that I find to be funny. Yes. This one is brilliant to me. I love this one. This was one of the only one. This is the only one that made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you know what, though? I was kind of happy that uh, some of these people died. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, there's, yeah, the fake ape, ape man is, I've been, I've paid, I paid a dollar to see uh, Jake the Alligator Man, who's in Marsh's uh, museum here in, uh, out in uh, Long Beach, Washington, and it's, you know, it's kind of like this uh, little man's head or torso on an alligator body, but it's only about 18 inches long. And right. supposedly they found it there. So this, to me, is one of, like, everybody knows it's a fake. Everybody knows it's a phony. But people flood to that. They buy bumper stickers and shirts, and they take the, their picture with it. And they do all this shit to look at it. That's what they should have done with the fake ape man. This thing should not have been thrown away or whatever they discarded like they did, but they probably did when, Oh fuck, this is garbage. It should have went on tour. Right. It right. should have been in a, in a uh, little sideshow, uh, you know, wharf, different music, little museum. And it, they should be making money with it right now. Right. All right. Let's um, real quickly. We'll summarize. Um, I'm going to, I'll quickly summarize the fatty Arbuckle scandal. Fatty Arbuckle, for those who don't know, was a silent movie actor. He was accused of, um, what's it, raping um, a young actress. And, yeah, he, he, was, he was drunk at a party. And, I mean, this guy was, he was obese even back then for their standards. Well, if, if your name is Fatty. Right. So he took advantage of a young Hollywood. It's not an story. ironic thing like uh, calling a big guy tiny. Right. So he took advantage of young Hollywood starlet, and while he was forcing her to have sex, he punctured her bladder with a beer bottle, and she ended up dying of a painful death of peri peri peritonitis. Yeah. Um, he was arrested, then he was end up found innocent. I, and so yeah, he ended up being he his, he was blacklisted from Hollywood after that. And never really did anything after that. And he died in 1933 from alcoholism and uh, after being falling into lurid obscurity. Yeah. So that's summarizing Fatty Arbuckle. You want to summarize <laughs> Black Dahlia? Yeah, Black Dahlia was a. Um, she was a. Uh, her name was Elizabeth Short. She was a aspiring um, actress in Hollywood, and in um, she was only 22 years old, and in, in 1947. Her body was found by a woman passing by uh, a vacant lot, found her body in two and completely drained of all of its blood. It obviously had been dumped there. Yeah. Yeah. It, everybody knows this case um, because it's, it's one of those long uh, cases from, uh, you know, from yesteryear that has never been, it's, a, it's still an open case. There's right. a lot of theories. There's uh, actually, there's a couple of different um, movies that are coming out and, it's, and there's a new series that's coming out here shortly. That's all about the Black Dahlia. And there's a, um, I believe he's a detective who believes it was his father because his father was a, was a doctor in LA to uh, movie stars. So they, he, so there's a lot of leads, but there's no actual concrete proof. So right. she's an actress, she, she was mutilated. Right. Well, and it got its name from the fact that uh, she was married to a Navy pilot or something like that. Yeah, she was engaged to a U.S. Yeah. Air Force pilot, but he died in, in August of 45. Yeah, and there was a um, 
It was the name was inspired by a recently released um, Blue Dahlia film, the Hollywood North style about a fighter bomber accused of the death of his faithless wife. Yeah. So that's where it got its name. They just changed it from blue to black. Then we have the Brinks job. I'll summarize that real quick. There's 11 dudes and they set out on this 18 month quest to rob the Brinks headquarters in Boston. That was the home base of the legendary private security firm. They practice this. They like, they had like military intensity to it and their attention to detail is just incredible. Um, so they stole, they, they created these approximation uniforms of the Brinks guards and they got, they, it all came out without a hitch. It was a perfect crime. They stole more than 12, 1.2 million in cash, which back in what, what year, 1950, 50, that was a lot of fucking money. Yeah. And they also stole 1.5 million in checks and securities. It's the biggest height heist of in American history at the time. Um, but while the plan was perfect, the participants proved to be all too human. Even as authority spent years trying to figure out who was behind the Great Brinks robbery, the eleven were falling out amongst themselves. Eventually, someone associated with them, the mob allegedly hired a hitman to kill Joseph Spex O'Keefe, a gang member who had been grousing that he had been cheated on, cheated of his proper share of the robbery. At that point, O'Keefe, wounded in the attempted rub out, decided to talk to the FBI. By '57, most of the gang had been sentenced to life in prison, except for O'Keefe, who got four years. No one would account for the bulk of the stolen funds. To this day, no one has found the money. Oh, wow. So I'll quickly do the Great Train Robbery in 1963. Great. Okay. So uh, the Great Train, uh, like I said, it was a train robbery. It, it, Fifteen thieves held up a royal train, a royal mail train between Glasgow and London in, in uh, eight, August 8th, 1963. They netted 120 bags packed with an equivalent of $7 million in the they were treated like folk heroes by the press and the public. Although the operation took all 15 minutes, the caper was smooth and it was pretty nonviolent except for one, a driver who was conked in the head. He never fully recovered from the trauma. Um, uh, the, the case lived on in memory because uh, the further adventures of one of its minor players, Ronnie Biggs, who escaped from prison and long eluded, uh, years of eluding justice were constant fodder for the, uh, for the British tabs. Readers are fascinated by the fault. The small time hood ended up being a part of the biggest heist in British history and only uh, to get away with it all. Biggs eventually gave him up, so, himself up in 2001, returning voluntarily to Brazil to serve 28 years remaining on his sentence despite his pleas of leniency. He remains incarcerated and in under failing health. Huh. All right. Let me sum up America's biggest art heist because I kind of like this one. All right. Uh, the rich chick, she was heiress. And wife of a rich man, her name is Isabella Stewart Gardner. She basically toured the world buying famous art. Like um, there was a Vermeer called the Concert and a Rembrandt called Storm on the Sea of Galilee. So these guys dressed up as Boston police officers waltzed into the museum that she had built in 1920 or in 1990. Was it? Yeah, 1990. Yeah. Um, they dressed up as cops, went in, tied up the guards, shut off the alarm system. They took off with the Vermeer and the Rembrandt and several less valuable pieces. The police has st estimated the Valley of Stolen Goods at $300 million. It is still considered the biggest art robbery on FBI's website because nothing has ever been recovered from it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. There was a time when somebody thought they had seen the Sea of Galilee, but still nothing from it. Um, otherwise, the thieves grabbed what they could, sometimes crudely, and a lot of them really didn't know what they had. So the Vermeer, one of only 32 known works by the artist in existence, may be worth at least $70 million. And, um, but it's unsellable on the open market because as soon as they try to sell it, they're getting busted. <laughs> right. Greatest art heist in American history, but it's also a botch because the shit they stole, they can't sell and get anything out of or they're going to get caught. Right. You know, and you, I'm sure that there's uh black market people that would, you know, step up and buy, buy this, buy this shit. And probably in the thing I have to say about art heists like this is if you're going to heist a very important piece, chances are professionals already have a buyer before they do it. 
Right. And, you know, that, that's my opinion of, of the situation. But, I mean, the Mona Lisa was a little known painting when it was stolen, but there's also a, um, if you've seen uh, the movie, um, The Freshman with Matthew Broderick and uh, Penelope Ann Miller, and um, uh, I guess there was a guy named Brando that was in it too, but he, uh, Matthew McConaughey is um, kind of in love with this mobster's daughter, and he's in her house and he's like, oh, that's a really good version of the Mona Lisa, and she's like, it's the real thing. The fake is in the museum. And the reason they threw that in there is because that is speculated that the painting that's actually in the Louvre is not the real one. Right. When it was stolen in, in 1911, it's still, the, a fake was the one that was returned. Right. Um, I'm so, going to skip Jean Bonnet. Yeah, I have daughters. I don't even want to talk about I, that. Uh, I'll, the only thing I'll say about the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case is there is a great documentary out there that points to the brother actually being the one that killed her okay and we're gonna we're gonna skip the two that happened after the year 2002 okay so go ahead and sum up the Versace killing spree and then this this is one that that i'll do uh (laughs) now if you don't know who Versace was Giovanni Versace he was a fashion designer everybody knows who Versace is come on okay (laughs) <laughs> even even before he died, people knew who he was. So, um, he was killed by a man named Andrew Cunanan, who uh, inevitably uh, was a uh, as he was a gay man. He was recently uh, um, uh, recently came down with the fact that he or got the news that he had AIDS. So he kind of went off the deep end after this, after having or contracting AIDS. He started out in California, where he would kill five people in all. Two former lovers, both both in uh, Minnesota, and then a rich man in Chicago whom he stole a Lexus, a cemetery caretaker in New Jersey for whom he, he took a pickup truck, fearing that the police were onto the Lexus, and most infamously he killed the grizzly fashion designer Gio, Giovanni Versace in in Miami. Kunana, what? The grizzly fashion designer? <laughs> oh, it is a glitzy. Well, he 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 did have a lot, five o'clock shadow. He had the gruff yeah. look. He had he had the uh, he had like that uh November thing going on. Right, the I Matthew think. McConaughey yeah. or what do I call it? <laughs> yeah, glitzy. I'm sorry, I can't even read the I can't read today. But uh, Kunana finally killed himself in an unoccupied houseboat not two miles away from the the, the scene of his last crime. And that from from what is known about him is likely he liked to embellish in his biography, loved to spend money that he did not have. And, and he loved to, or he learned to deal drugs. And that he was fueled by envy, obsessed with his status and fame. That combined with the realization that his looks were failing, and thus his markability to rich gay men, and that may have led to his panic. But only Kunana knew for certain what his motives were. The high lives can produce very low forms of existence. Right. And again, we didn't talk about the 1924 killing of Bobby Franks by Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. Yeah. Uh, but it, that one was really creepy, too. So if you, you get a chance sometime, people, check yeah. that out. There's some good documentaries on YouTube about it. We uh, ran out of time to talk about the uh, the Tony Mus- uh, Musselin uh, case, too. That was another one that was a crime of the century. Um, the Antwerp diamond heist. We didn't get, we ran out of time for that one. Uh, the Patrick Henry uh, uh, Cronin. So there's a bunch of them that were actually considered crimes of the century. And one thing I wanted to do at the top of the show, but we uh, we just jumped right in. What, what we do here at the uh, Bunny Rabbit's Hole. But, uh, <laughs> The definition of crime of the century is an enigmatic phrase that is used to describe particularly sensitive or notorious criminal cases. That in the United States, it is often not, though, exclusively used to reference the Lindbergh kidnapping, which we didn't talk about either. That, however, the phrase was popular, uh, was in popular use much earlier than the 19th century and has been used repeatedly ever since. That was right off of Wikipedia. Well, reality... Reality is, it's just a fucking buzzword. It it is, you know, it's just like uh, 
using madcap and zany if right. you describe your your sitcom. All right, here I'll do a quick run rundown of the Lindbergh kidnapping on winter's night seventy five years ago. Child was torn out of house in New Jersey. He was no ordinary infant, but he was a son of the aviator Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh, at the time, was considered America's greatest hero, who just five years before had become the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. For the next two and a half months, America and much of the world was riveted by the daily updates and speculation from the police. Search for baby Charles. Suspicion spared no one, not even the Lindberghs. In April, news spread that a ransom had been paid, but still no child was recovered. Finally, in May, they found the corpse of the child, and I'm not getting into that part because it, I have kids. Yeah, all. we all have kids. Yep, and it, they end up having a trial, sentencing, and the execution of German carpenter and ex-convent Bruno Richard Hopman for the crime. With extend the infamy of the case for four more years, but the Lindbergh kidnapping had become more than just a particularly heinous act; it had become the crime of the century. Many other crimes have earned the distinction, but what makes him famous event deserving of the title of "Crime of the Century"? Who knows? All right, so. We just gave you guys about 75 crimes of the century. I want to ask you, of all of them that we covered and those that we didn't cover but we do know, we mentioned them but just by name but didn't did go in-depth, what do you think the crime of the century was? Not, yeah. counting, the, not counting the Holocaust because that, <sighs> that, that's, I think – I think hands down everybody. So that's the easy answer. Okay. So that is the, that is, that's the crime of the millennium. Yeah. So, so mm. what would you say the crime of the century would be? For me, uh, if I'm going through the stuff that we talked about, I'm going to go with, uh, the assassination of Marilyn Monroe because it wasn't a drug overdose; it was an assassination. It, okay, yeah. And uh, I will tell you, into... I will tell you why I believe it was an assassination because at the time of her death, she was sleeping with both um, JFK and his brother Bobby, and her and Bobby were they because the government had put wires in there and recorded everything that she was saying. They heard the whole argument. They heard when she died, she was being suffocated. They heard Bobby say, give her something to calm her down. Then they injected her with something. They fucking killed Marilyn because she came out and said, I've got enough shit that'll hit the headlines first lickety split. <laughs> so that's my answer. Okay. I, I agree. And I want to throw this out there really quick. Okay. Big girls. Um, Yes, Marilyn Monroe was a 14 to 16 size, but that doesn't mean she wears the same 14 to 16 size that you did because I'm going by uh, E! Online's women clothing size uh, chart here. They said they are vastly different. Or today's standard clothing sizes are vastly different than they were 50 years ago. For, for instance, a size 8 dress today is nearly the equivalent of a size 16 in 1958. So, that being said, if you're a size 16, you're twice the size that she was. You were not, she was not a big girl like you. Okay, so drop it. But there's nothing wrong with big girls. because No, there's of... not. There's not, but I'm, I'm just tired of, you know, um, you know, you're eating, you're shoving the fucking, uh, you know, shit in your face and go, I'm Marilyn Monroe's a 16. No, 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 there's a place for big girls. And it's not comparing yourself to Marilyn Monroe. No. Okay. So, that being said, I am actually going to give it up to the Manson family for having the crime of the century. All right. All right. I can give you that one. Because of some of the things we talked about earlier, it changed America. It killed the hippie movement and took the hippie counterculture and turned them into yuppies over the next 10 years. So that would be a point in history, like when we talked about that one with the time jumping and shit? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, a, it was an 
event in history that changed the future. I, I think the death of the LaBiancas and the death of the Tates and the Folgers and everybody else that died in, in that horrific act, that changed how people, because really that was one of the first major um, events like this that made the news. Manson was OJ long before OJ killed his wife. Right. And, they, you know, let's, I, I don't mean to like cut you off, but I mean, let's also consider how gruesome it was. These people were enjoying what they were doing. Oh, yeah. And not, not in the tape, but the other ones. I mean, they took a fork and carved the word pig in this guy's stomach and left the fork stuck in his left, stomach. Yes, left the fork stuck in him. These people were enjoying every second of what they were doing. They were doing it for Charlie. Yes. They were a family. Charlie was in charge of the family. Everything that they did result, revolved around Charlie. There was other murders, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that were uh, there. They, you know, they... Well, not they weren't just murders. They, they were robberies and shit like that. They stole uh -huh. them all over the place. Well, you, everybody knows, people that know the case know the Spawn Ranch, which was an old movie set. And they lived on this movie set. And how they stayed there was the old man that owned the place, the girls would go up and do whatever Charlie told them to do to this man. Mm -hmm. And he was this old, uh, really, I mean, he was old. He could barely see. But they were going up there and they were, you know, performing for the man. They were doing whatever Charlie told them to do. And he left them alone. He let them stay up there. Right. And I mean, Charlie told these people to do some sick fucking shit, too. Yes. I mean, he would do it for his own entertainment. Charlie had a twisted fucking mind. Yes. Charlie was about, and, and this, uh, this case came out, there's a lot of different events that came out right around the same time that kind of played into all this. Now, uh, this is a couple years after Woodstock. This is, you know, the hippie movement's kind of dying down, but not really because now the people that were 18 in 1960 are almost 30 in 69. So they're, they got to start settling down. And people, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it's not like today. They don't live with their moms and their dads until, you know, they're well into their mid-20s. Right. They don't. They're not. They're start. They started their lives a lot earlier. Most people didn't go on to get their master, or their masters, or their bad. Or, you know, a lot of them didn't even go to college. They just went straight into the workforce, or they, and, you know. And for those of you that are like on freaking out about this shit, no need to fear. Charlie died a year ago. Yes. In Charlie prison. Is dead. But he still resonates. How many years later? And. He was really he, – he wasn't even there when they killed these people. Right. He just sent them off to do it. He had, um, he, had, he had men that, you know, basically worked for him that were like his right and left-hand men that would, he would just say, hey, look over this, make them do this stuff. Tex Watson was a scary, scary motherfucker. And that was uh, Charlie's right-hand man. He's the one that drove the women up to the first – that to the first murder. I think he was at the second one too, but he ended up getting a separate trial for a different, for something different down in Texas. So I think he ended up dying a lot quicker. Yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. If you guys want to hear us do an entire podcast on the Manson family and everything like that, let us know in the comments and then we'll do it. Manson's um, and the like, death of the hippies. Right. You know, otherwise we'll, we'll wrap it all. Otherwise we're going to go for hours. Right. We've been doing this for two hours already. So, I think we should sum this up and, you know, basically I'm going to let you sum it up this week, Jason. All right. So we talked about a lot of fucking crimes, you know, for everything from the fake ape man to fatty Arbuckle and everything in between. Uh, we talked about art being uh, uh, stolen. We talked about cannibals. We talked about uh, teachers marrying uh, their students. We talked about uh, school shootings and an aptitude of uh, parents and police. We talked about, uh, 
the brinks getting robbed trains getting robbed we talked about lana uh turner having her kid kill her boyfriend we uh we talked about a lot of a lot of uh a lot of shit yeah so. yeah we did <laughs> and we didn't really go down many rabbit holes this time we did we had too much information we over we over analyzed yes this one this week but it's good because this is one that uh i mean each rabbit hole really was another crime of the century this week. Right. So, Yeah, and like we said, there's really no format to this show. Yeah, there may be some episodes where there's not many rabbit holes. There may be some episodes where it's all a rabbit hole. <laughs> exactly. we're, we, we will do one where we don't have a theme, but the theme is a rabbit hole. We'll just start talking and just let it go and we'll see how chaotic it can fucking be. Right. Like, hey, did you hear about that thing that happened the other day? No, what happened? No, oh, that thing happened. No, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Or, you know, you know, just be the ramblings of somebody who gets stoned. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. With that being said, we're going to wrap today's episode up, this week's episode up. So, from myself, Jason, and, and you. My, and myself, Craig. This is the Bunny Rabbit's Hole. Insert tagline here. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button below if you're watching it on YouTube. If not, hey, come back and check us out. We're going to have more because we follow love us, you. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Yep. So peace out, everyone. We love you. All right. Goodbye.